everyone. Thank you for joining. I have Jessup Petrosky with us today. We're talking about the future of travel and how AR can be used in travel during this coronavirus time. So please stay tuned. We will be right back. Hi, good morning everyone, and thank you for joining us for Seeking Sustainability Live number 76 today. We have Jessup Petrosky, and we're talking about the future of travel. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessup. Yeah, thanks for having me. Do you want to start by just briefly introducing yourself? Sure. Yeah, so... Um... As Joyce said, my name is Jessup, kind of a, a rare name. Most people, it's their first time to hear it. Uh, I'm from the United States, born and raised in the state of Ohio. Uh, moved to Japan back in 2009 uh, and came over here. I was working for in the publishing business, uh, working with the American Chamber of Commerce specifically at that time. Uh, I've also done some work for the Ohio Department of Development. Uh, years back and in the last eight years I've specifically worked in various fields of uh, digital technology, di digital services, uh, content creation and so uh, a bit of a hodgepodge of experiences uh, and, and now most recently as of last year I jumped into the travel industry. Yeah, it's very exciting. So you're in my territory now. So hopefully we're going to be able to meld our two worlds because you're an AR, VR, digital expert. And I'm very passionate about sustainability. So we're going to try to put those together, those ideas today. I have, I have your introductory video on Vimeo. Do you mind if I show that just to give people an idea? Sure, that's fine. All right, let's do it. See if this works. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, I love you know, uh, I love now, the music behind. Yeah, I don't know if those are Tycho drums or not, but they they sounded like it. And Tycho are one of the one of the most powerful moving uh, uh, you know musical performances I've ever heard. And so I, I I felt that that was kind of a nice representation of of who I am or and where I'm trying to go right now. Trying to muster up as much positive energy as I can right now during these times. And so uh, I, I whipped that together, I think, a couple of weeks ago in some of my spare time trying to uh, you know, brand myself a little bit. Yeah, no, it's great. It's a great way to, to brand yourself and show your skill. You do a lot of those short videos, I've noticed, to promote different projects that you're doing. Yeah, you know, I kind of... Uh, I kind of got back into that about a month ago. I had uh, I had gone to school actually for 3D design and animation, basically making animated movies. This was back in 1997 when I think there was a handful, maybe Toy Story had just come out, and this whole world of animated movies was just beginning. And so I learned 
about video editing and animation and design and uh, all of this stuff. But I, I did realize while I was in there uh, at university that I'm not one to really sit at a computer too long for 10, 12 hours editing and modeling. And so I pick up picked up the skills, but I never really applied them too much after I graduated a little bit here and there. But for some reason, uh, during this time, uh, I guess a lot of my past or my artistic um, intuitions kind of came back and I started writing again. I started producing videos, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's one thing that's positive that's come out of this, almost like the arts, a little bit of a renaissance, and I'm seeing it more and more other people. Um, I've got a friend back home that's a, he works at a hair salon and they were shut down for a while. So what did he start to do? He, he picked up the paintbrush uh, probably hasn't painted or done any drawings, I'm sure, for years. He's doing incredible work right now. And so, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a, com a combination of it's a great, time. Yeah, great, great time to pick up things you haven't done for a while or brush up on things that you want to improve. It's great foundation building. And I think we'll talk about that a bit later, how yeah. this could be a great time for the tourism industry to also build a great brand, build foundations. Uh, let's just touch on some of your previous work. You did an interesting mixed reality thing for Rakuten when you were working for them. Can you yeah. just briefly introduce that? Sure. So I, I was at Rock 10 during pretty interesting time where Rock 10 was really doing a lot of sports partnerships. Uh, they had just uh, partnered up with the football or soccer team in Europe, uh, FC Barcelona, quite famous. Um, and they had also just uh, partnered up with the NBA's Golden State Warriors as well. And so they were looking at a way to leverage these partnerships and, and and maximize the technology that was within Rock 10 at the time. And so I think they made a request for proposals and there was about 300 submitted ideas at that time. And I, our idea to leverage the technology of AR, which a lot of people have heard of and they get confused with VR, virtual reality as well. And I thought, why don't we kind of bring the the technology of the future to the present it's very applicable and uh yeah we proposed merging fc barcelona's um coming to japan they came to rock 10 cafe and they were going to display jerseys uh for fans to see but i thought why not only see them in a case you know it's a few seconds it's cool but if we can extract them in AR, it, it really makes an engaging experience. And so we, A, leverage Rock 10's technology, and B, we gave people a really unique way to interact with a, a new a new brand that they know and bring jerseys framed in glass out in person, get to see them on the players in front of you. It was really an exciting project that uh, a lot of people enjoyed. That's great. Uh, yeah. We got our first comment from Holy Grim. I'm so proud of my son, Jessup. He's an amazing man. Thanks, Mama. <laughs> yeah, leave it to her to be the first to comment, right? <laughs> that's great. You got to have family support. But that's a perfect segue into I want to introduce something which I think is very key to sustainability. You yep. took paternity leave and you did an amazing trip while you were on paternity leave. Can you introduce that to us? Sure, sure. Yeah. So, um, when my son was born, um, and my wife had taken a year off uh, for that whole process, and uh, I was lucky enough to be working at Rock 10 at the time as well, and they really uh, encouraged this too. And so I took three months off, and we did a seven-week trip to the Southern Hemisphere uh, with a nine-month-old baby at the time. <laughs> a lot of people thought we were crazy, but um, you know, for, for us, it was all about... A, getting, getting out of the, the cold Japan winter and going somewhere nice and warm, but B, also just getting, getting our son used to you know, moving around, being exposed to different, different uh, environments, different people, um, and getting to see the world through a different lens, especially before he was going to go into uh, preschool from one year. And so we did uh, six countries in seven weeks, uh, pulled it off without a hitch. 
all with backpacks as well, um, you know, packed light, uh, very mobile. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing trip. Uh, and I think, you know, of course, our son probably doesn't really remember the details right now, but there are things that he'll see pictures or images or things around the house and he will comment about it. So I think the seeds have been planted there. And it was, you know, it was a great experience. I, you know, as we were out, we were meeting people doing the same thing. But by and large, I think most people would never imagine, you know, going on a trip with a newborn under one years old. Uh, I couldn't encourage it more. I mean, we had no problems. Everyone was very supportive. You sit down to eat. The staff would come and carry your son and let you have a couple moments of peace as well. So it was nice. That's really great. Yeah, we we didn't take as much time as you, but whenever we traveled with our kids when they were small, it was always worth it. And it's it's such a great. I don't I don't think you have to change your schedule too much with a young one, um, whether you're on the road or at home. It's basically pretty similar. So we we also found very rewarding. But the reason I wanted to mention that is because it's so important, especially in Japan, for men to also play more of a role at home with parenting and to take your paternity leave as a family helps to not only for your kids, but also helps your relationship and it helps society, I think, in a way, because you're creating a two-parent system instead of a one-parent system and uh, helping out each other. And that's that's really powerful part of social equity, I would say. Oh, oh definitely. I mean, of course, I was here for my son and everything uh, during the nine months while he was home with his mom. But, you know, we definitely established a very strong bond during those, those seven weeks. And so um, I, I highly encourage it, whether you travel or not. Um, I think, yeah, the father, especially in Japan, it's more and more uh, encouraged uh, to do that. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy to actually talk with any any father or any guy that's thinking about about doing that. They could they could reach out to me and if they have any questions. That's great. Um, yeah. I just want to introduce your Instagram page. Okay. Um, you also show your love of travel through all your posts on Instagram. You've been all over Asia and and Europe as well, or well, most mostly Asia, to be honest. Yeah, I think I've covered most of the Asia Pacific uh, countries at this point. Uh, Europe, actually, just a little bit, but I've primarily been here. Came here the first time in 2001. Uh, my father was actually working in Japan, and it was a uh, summer holiday in the U.S. I was in university, and he invited me over to spend three months with him. Uh, a little bit of bonding time as well. And... Uh, yeah, it kind of suck, you know, it, it really sunk its teeth into me. And I couldn't, uh, once I went back to Ohio, I couldn't forget the experience in Japan. And so I've been coming back ever since. That's great. And on you're also very active on Vimeo and LinkedIn if people want to find you, right? Yeah, yeah, LinkedIn for quite a while. Vimeo is a little bit new. Uh, just opened an account a couple months ago. A part of a project which I believe we'll be talking about in a little bit and so yeah I'm I'm trying to be active on most of the platforms uh, a to like I said you know brand myself a bit but B I, I think it's really a little bit therapeutic for me to be dabbling in various forms of content and art so yeah and I came across your profile on travel massive I'd never heard of them before yeah yeah I I think I had met someone last year when I got into the travel industry, and uh, I don't think they're too big in Japan right now. It's more of a global network. I think 60,000 people uh, registered there right now, and so a great platform if you're looking to connect with other people and travel, if you're running events and whatnot. So yeah, highly encourage getting in there too. And you did some work with ACCJ Journal and Metropolis, is that right? Yeah, that was my that was my first uh, job in Japan. My introduction to uh, the wor the working life in Japan uh, back in 2010. I had started that. Yeah. All right. Let's dive into your most recent exciting project between Ireland and Japan. Can you introduce that to us? Sure. So this project really came about through you know a lot of serendipitous 
kind of uh, opportunities. Well, one was back in March when everyone went into lockdown and in working in the travel industry, we quickly saw that uh, cross-border travel was going to come to a, to a halt for you know a few months, we thought, you know, maybe take a, a bit of a pause and then come back. And so I right away thought about leveraging technology such as we're doing here and, and bringing uh, destinations online, bring, bringing the destination or the experience to people since we can't go there. And so um, I had a connection in Ireland who reached out to me in early March and he said, hey Jess, I think there's something we can do during this lockdown. Uh, we've got some beautiful content, some drone footage from Ireland um, and would you be able to purpose it in some way in the travel industry to kind of bring hope to people around the world that, you know, A, you know, Ireland's very beautiful, but but B, more than that, like just that here's something that can be a little bit therapeutic for everyone, you know, watching this footage. And so I thought it was an interesting idea. I honestly didn't know what I was going to do with it at first. Um, at the same time, there was a company here in Tokyo called Zyko. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a it's an e-ticketing platform, and they're primarily in the music industry, and they provide e-tickets for people who like to go to concerts. So you can register, you can find concerts online, register, and you know you get the the ticket sent to your phone. No paper tickets, very sustainable. Um, they were also going through a hard time because there were all the events were getting canceled, and so there is two parallels of not being able to travel, not going to events. Um, and they had mentioned to me that they were quickly uh, pivoting their platform into a streaming platform where people could come, buy an e-ticket to experience uh, an event, a live event or a pre-recorded event online. And I thought, okay, this is it. All everything is lining up. But you know, basically, to... um, you know, there were there were these three things that came together, and I had the content from Ireland and I thought, okay, just watching drone footage for an hour might not be compelling enough. And so I was on Instagram as well and I found an artist in Kyoto uh, named Akira Miyanaga. And Akira is also a professor at a university there, but he also has been dabbling into the arts and playing around with uh, stocked footage and doing some very cool uh, compositions very short five or 10 second clips. And he incorporates a lot of landscapes, a lot of scenery. And every time I watched uh, his videos, I, I felt even for a, a small while I was traveling, you know, virtually. And so I reached out to Akira and, and I suggested that maybe he'd take a look at the drone footage from Ireland uh, to use in one of his clips. And he agreed, but he said, you know, I don't wanna just take the content and make something that I have no knowledge about it. and he said so if i'm going to do this i would like to learn about ireland you know where is it its history its culture he wanted to take four or five weeks to study it and so you know the the seeds were planted and now i had basically decided okay let's try to be, bridge japan and ireland in some way it looks like there's cultural interest as well so i formed a team of volunteers basically that came together and we took Akira on a virtual trip of Ireland through, uh, we brought in people to do Zoom calls, um, historians, uh, folk writers, uh, musicians. And so Akira over four weeks, we were documenting his journey basically, uh, learning and discovering about Ireland um, through Japan, both Japanese that have been to Ireland and, and of course Irish people living in Japan and in Ireland. And at the end of the day, at the end of the project, he had made a 10-minute composition called "Run" um, about his interpretation of what Ireland is in a very abstract way. And so, we had broadcast that on June 29th on Zyko platform um, to give people, you know, an experience of traveling, but also a way of connecting with one another. Um, and the project was. You know, it was quite challenging because at that time we didn't really know what we were going to make at the end, what the end product was, uh, let alone all of us were working remotely and all of us did not know each other prior to the project. <laughs> so <laughs> it was really interesting to have to work daily remotely with people that you don't know 
um, and to pull off um, in the execution of you know what's close to a one hour uh, production. Wow, it's really yeah. impressive. It's beautiful, like uh, creative artistic work as well as great drone footage, like you said. And it's a lot of it is showing things upside down. So, <laughs> so one side is Ireland and then the sky is Japan. Is that right? Have I got it right? Well, he actually, I don't know if he incorporated anything from Japan. It might all be from Ireland, but he does use a lot of different perspectives. I think he'll use a sailboat that's in the sky that's upside down. And you, you almost don't know what you're watching for a little bit, but it all comes together and the music. Um, and so, you know, this was kind of a pilot project. Um, we didn't know what was going to happen after, and we still kind of don't. What I do hope that comes out of it, like you had just mentioned, is maybe there can be um, more collaborations between two countries. A lot of times whenever we're promoting destinations, and that's that's the business that, that I'm in, is promoting destination from one perspective, is when there's a cross-collaboration um, that people from both sides can artistically make something or exchange information, that it becomes a lot richer and we did find that a lot of the Japanese that watched it didn't feel that it was um, Irish people talking about how great Ireland was in one way, but it was really this culmination of exchange. And we found that Ireland and Japan did have a lot of similarities. Um, and we can probably go a lot deeper in this series. And so we're actually talking with various entities and organizations that like, what can we do with this now moving forward, maybe to A, produce more content, or B, what kind of uh, long-term uh, cultural relations might come between Ireland and Japan, or maybe, you know, Japan and other countries. And I think that enriches both sides. So that was kind of, well, we originally went in as kind of a virtual trip. Uh, really, at the end of the day, we grew to be much more of a personal connection amongst people uh, and in a deep cultural exchange, which I think is going to last beyond the lockdown um, and, you know, really have some uh, some roots planted here that people will look back and say, hey, wow, look what look what happened because of the situation. And now we have this, you know, this amazing relationship with Ireland and Japan. So, yeah, great. And um, I, I often, looking through your stuff, watching the, the clips and stuff from that film, it really it makes me think about what is the future of travel and how can we help, and this is the problem with traditional travel as well, how can we help locals benefit from tourism? Right. How how can we have a balance between the customer coming in and the quality of life of local people? And I think there is a lot of potential. And we'll, we'll talk about that a, a bit later, maybe okay. from some of the other projects you point out in your sure. four tech. Every tourist industry <laughs> person needs to be thinking about right now. Okay. Um, but yeah, there I think with AR, there actually may be more potential to benefit local communities than the traditional model of mass tourism, cruise tourism, over tourism, definitely. Yes, yeah, I agree. Uh, let's talk about uh, a previous project you did with Nepal, the okay. AR. Sure. So this was back in, refresh my memory, when did this, it was 2015? 2015, looks like, yeah. yeah. 2015 there was a huge earthquake in Nepal and at that time I was working uh, for an AR startup um, actually they were out of New Zealand originally and they had an office here in Tokyo it's called uh, Quiver Vision uh, originally it was called Puteco Limited and they were one of the first com uh, companies that developed a technique of uh, making coloring pages for children where you could then uh, download an app on your phone, open the app, which opened a camera, view it, and it would extract the color off the coloring page and bring that into a, a live 3D object as you colored it right, right in front of you on the table or wherever. And so I was working for them, and we were doing a lot of things about education and, <clears throat> of course, the marketing and promotional stuff. But I thought when this happened in Nepal, 
And there's a lot of fundraiser activity as well that was taking place. And I was also a member of uh, an NPO called All Hands Volunteers, who I had come in contact with in Tohoku years prior. And I suggested to them that we engage people uh, with the AR technology that we had developed. We make some coloring pages that A, people could enjoy, um, and B, could be a way of them doing fundraising through uh, in-app purchases of the AR experience itself. And so we, we developed, I think, three pages that you could download at home, you could color them, and there they had everything from like a mandala, which if you colored it, you'd come to life and different shapes would come out and dance around and it had Nepalese music. Um, another experience was, uh, you know, like, where is Nepal? It was basically an earth that popped up on in front of you and it showed the flag of Nepal and you could zoom in and it had a lot of images and videos. So it was very educational. And I think that we had a Nepalese flag that you could color and there was some history there. So we actually were able to leverage the technology to um, engage with people that probably wouldn't have had, maybe not have had interest or not have known much about Nepal and educate them. But we we're also able to, to fundraise and put money into the hands of an NPO, which was then uh, doing the work there on the ground in Nepal. And so we literally, you know, you could be sitting in your room in Tokyo, coloring, you know, a piece of paper and supporting groundwork in Nepal. I just thought it was so amazing. This was back in the 2015, so five years ago. It's not like the technology has just suddenly appeared. And so I think that now is also a way that we could really maybe a lot of times in like disasters or hard times is when innovation can really have its chance <laughs> to make an impact. And so I do hope that, you know, maybe that's the case moving forward. Yeah, uh, it was really interesting. The video uh, on the page are really worth watching um, to give you an idea of how it would work in a classroom or at home. Um, I like the Porsche 3D augmented reality one as well. Um, this would be very useful for product or service introduction. Why not? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, uh, you know, I really encourage if you go to the quivervision.com website, you can go and you can download the pages for free. Um, they have quiver experiences that are a little bit more marketing. And there's also quiver education, which is all stuff uh, made basically for elementary school students to experience, you know, animals, um, Mole molecules to be able to see that live in front of you. I think they have landmarks now. And so they're really doing some really cool stuff. And the funny thing is, you know, we, we built the pages for kids, but when adults sit down in color, <laughs> which is all, you know, there was a trend a few years ago with adult coloring books. I don't know why that went out of fashion, but, you know, they were selling pretty well. Um, that adults really, really latch onto it and, um, enjoy the experience and learn something more by engaging too. So yeah, I definitely encourage anyone out there to go and, and just download, download the app, print off some pages and, and really try it. Um, to watch a video is nice, but to experience it with your phone, um, it's really amazing. Yeah. I, I also thought about the, the need for relaxation right now, how people are dealing with the stress of coronavirus, making something like a, a coloring book of a destination around the world, uh, coloring it in just to clear your mind, kind of meditative. I think that's why those were popular, right? And yeah. then using your phone to have the augmented reality, to have extra video loops or extra information come up. I think it really could have great applications into the tourism industry and, and to connect people to different destinations and give them that extra sense of release in stress. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that now we're seeing that we can't physically travel, we can't go from point A to point B, that a lot of the experiences can actually come to you. And so, you know, the reality is that for most people, even in their lifetime, they're never going to be able to physically visit all the places that they want. <laughs> um, 
So, but they can still engage with the destination's brand in a way, whether it's food or music or whatever that is. And so we, we have to find a way that it's almost a two way uh, exchange. And so that tourism and travel is not only, and believe me, I love physically going somewhere. You know, if I could every month, I would. But the reality of it is, yeah, it's not sustainable. Um, and, and, you know, when I came into the industry last year, kind of at its peak, everything was flying high, record numbers, everyone was high-fiving, and it was wonderful, a lot of economic benefit, but the big topic, and the elephant in the room was the over-tourism, we're going to have to start looking at this in sustainable tourism and smart cities. This next, next decade, we're going to have to figure that out, and I think in a way, coronavirus a little bit helped uh, resolve a lot of those problems. You know, the big question is going to be, uh, whenever it is safe to go back and the borders start opening and logistically the planes start flying again, how are we going to uh, promote, regulate, uh, disperse people moving forward? And so I think that we have to find ways to bring more experiences to people uh, at home uh, or even if it's not at home to where they're at. So I think yeah, technology can do that. Yeah, for sure. And then you could, like, you, like you showed with the Nepal case, you should, you could also add local benefit. Like mm. local people who get involved in the project, maybe they take part in a short video introducing making washi paper, for example. And then anybody who clicks on that part, that shop or that artisan would get some financial benefit as well. I mean, there, there are so many great sustainable tourism applications, I think. Oh, yeah, you could tie in e-commerce to it as well. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff that you can do now, and it's, it's not so far-fetched. Uh, all of the various technologies are, before they were a bit segmented, but now everything's coming together. E even AR, one of the biggest hurdles was a lot of people had to download a different app for different experiences, or your phone had to have, you know, so many specs. But now the phones, of course, are getting better, and uh, web AR is the next frontier that's kind of emerged last year, where you can basically send someone a URL, just even as simple as in Facebook Messenger. They click on it, you know, with their phone, and then the AR experience pops up. There's no app download or anything, and so I think as the friction becomes less to the experience and people don't have to download things and waits and loading times. I think people will use it and it can provide more than just a novelty wow experience. It can actually provide a more applicable um, experience for the user and then the people on the other end as well. Yeah, for sure. Holly Grimm says that's a great idea. Thank you, Holly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go to your article uh, for tech that tourism industry should be thinking about and using right now. Great article. And Thank of you. course, you included me. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, you've got some great ideas there. Let's go through them. Sure. Can you introduce your article a little bit? Yeah, so I wrote this article, I believe it was like two two weeks ago, and I, you know, coming from the digital and the tech space and working in travel for a year now, I saw that there was actually a really big gap and a lot of people weren't talking about how these technologies can really be applied, especially right now, uh, not just an idea for the future. And so I tried to give actual um, examples in the article of people or organizations that are using uh, the various technologies. And I think one of the first ones I had mentioned was called what's called photogrammetry, kind of a big word um, that has really kind of emerged in the last year or so. And it ties in with AR and VR in a way. But basically, it allows you to go out and like 360 cameras, which we've all kind of experienced those experiences before, you can basically um, take images of an environment, very small images, and kind of mesh them or map them together and create a virtual or a, a digital twin of the uh, place itself. And unlike a, a VR 360 where you're basically in a sphere uh, of images, it's uh, three-dimensional. And so in photogrammetry, there was a video on there 
uh, where a guy named uh, Andrew Svanberg, Mm -hmm. he had made a small video about his memories of Australia. And if you do watch the video, um, I think it's two minutes long and it kind of takes you through Australia and the sounds are amazing. But um, he did all of that by mapping it with camera and it's a 3D digital world. If you, you know, you can tell it's not completely realistic, but it's pretty much as close as you can get. And so I found that that could really be something that destinations and, and tourism should be looking at right now is like, how do we uh, use photogrammetry to make a digital double basically of our destination and be able to allow people to experience that now? That's amazing. I thought that was uh, like a animation, like CG. It's well, amazing. Yeah, I mean, it does look like uh, animation. In a way, it, it's kind of a, a, a mesh between images and CG. And so the technology is getting so good now that a little scary for some people how how realistic it is, to be honest. Um, but I do think that um, destinations, and especially like if we're thinking about historical or, or preserving um, places that you know, we're not going to be able to see in a few years or a few decades, really start thinking about how do we make the digital double so that uh, our you know, our children or grandchildren can see, not only see the picture now, but they could literally walk through and see what it looked like in the past. So I think yeah. this is one technology that we are going to see in the next few years become very commonplace. That's really exciting um, yeah. because th- that's one of the recommendations I make to local destinations now is you should be going out when it's good weather and taking photos and short videos of your area and building a brand during this time when you don't have tourism and start to get the information, the, get the content out there because people aren't aware of how great your area is. Well, actually, you know, when the Ireland-Japan thing started prior to this, I actually saw all of the videos coming out. I think Venice got a lot of attention for how empty it was, but the the water was cleaning up and the air quality was improving. And I thought, wow, this is, this is good for the earth. And I think that all of the destinations uh tourism boards should embrace this moment like you said either to get to get footage or to maybe really look at how we now take advantage of okay we're always have too many people so we can't repair that bridge or we can't implement uh different measures for more sustainable um activities why don't we do that now you know cleanup efforts uh refurbishing restoration like right now is kind of the time for doing all those projects that they put off but also like you said you can really capture the beauty of a place now um, engage people currently and then when they do come back as well um, try to implement measures to to keep that and on the flip side you can show the reality you can show the plastic pollution on our beaches and hopefully put some soft pressure on the industries that are making it there, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I, like that you, I like that you talk about reality. Sometimes people say, well, you work in AR, VR, what is it? And I said augmented reality, virtual reality. But what I like to focus on is the R or the reality. Yes. Yes. Because actually you have to understand the applications of it do impact uh you know, real things, you know, just like the uh, the Nepal fundraiser and whatnot. So there always has to be, I think, not just the novel digital experience, but there has to be some connection to the reality that makes an impact, yeah. whether it's a photograph, a video, or the AR, the VR. And it cannot be greenwashed. That was a problem with uh, advertising tourism in the past, right? Is everything looks amazing. You go there and it's like, that's not from the picture, you know? So if you, if you have AR or VR, you have to have that element of what it actually looks like as well as enhanced, which is a, sometimes a tricky balance, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely is, yeah. Um, I love this. One million people just visited a virtual destination, and it was amazing. Um, <laughs> you also talked about this in your podcast, right? Yeah. The, so yeah. really exciting. Can you introduce this, the Tomorrowland? 
Tomorrowland, yeah. So I, I've started writing weekly articles where I'm finding how technology and, and travel tourism are overlapping. And this wasn't specifically travel related. It was um, it was an event organizer out of Belgium that does EDM concerts uh, for the past couple years. And I think they usually draw about 400,000 people to these concerts, uh, which is huge, huge number. Um, but at the same time, they're kind of capped. It's kind of limited to 400,000. So uh, what they did this year, because they couldn't have the event, uh, the show must go on. And they pulled together, I think it was around 200 people, artists, CG creators. In three months' time, they produced not only like a virtual concert where they recorded, I believe 60 artists recorded in studios, but they built uh, a variety of stages and they actually built an island uh, for the event to be held. And so, you know, the experience wasn't just come listen to music. Uh, they could have done that easily just in a studio and, and film that, but they actually build an Island with weather, with seasons. Um, I think they said, you know, it's sunny in one area, you can go to another place and it's snowing or something. And so I, I found this fascinating that they did an online event, but it really incorporated, again, the concept of going somewhere, at least virtually, uh, or traveling to a place. And so I have found a lot of similarities between the music industry and the travel industry. Uh, you know, people go to concerts. They not only go to the concert, they go to the, the location, the destination of where it's being held. And so I have, t in talking with people, there's a big gap as well between the event organizers or the music industry and working with the tourism boards properly to say, okay, now that all these people are coming in, A, how do we do it sustainably? But B, you know, what could people experience when they come or, you know, what could they give back rather than just coming, leaving a bunch of garbage and leaving? And so I thought, you know, this was a really cool model where not only did they bring a million people, you know, they <laughs> over doubled their 400,000, it was very sustainable and uh you know i think for let's just say this was a this was a a fictitious destination but they could have made it a real place right and uh, people could have experienced real belgium um and then had an interest to maybe physically go there but you know at least to be able to have the digital experience they could connect in some way which then makes them interested in belgian food or drink which you know helps the economy uh, in different ways. And so I think travel and tourism actually, it impacts more than just going there and staying at the hotel and the tax dollars at the airport. But, you know, you come back, you buy uh, food, drink, music, even in your home country that's maybe related to the country that you visited. And so it impacts uh, food and agriculture, um, all of these various uh, different components of, of a place. Absolutely. It impacts the branding of the country as well as branding of the destination and the food and the culture and, and the exports, even technology, you know, exports from Japan, technology exports. They find that if people have an interest in visiting Japan, that they're yeah. more likely to buy Japanese cars or Japanese TVs. That's amazing, right? Well, yeah, you know, it's kind of like the Ireland Japan thing that we did. We had Irish musicians that had their their music on the on the broadcast and they were thrilled that their music was being heard by japanese vice versa for akira you know irish people got to see this uh japanese artist in kyoto that they never would have known and you know who knows if he can you know he did say whenever it's safe to go i definitely want to go to ireland and we all do now and so there is and those musicians are going to want to come to japan and so i think if there's there's more of a reciprocal exchange, like I think we talked about earlier, more than, you know, we're all just trying to grab at people coming, you know, either inbound or, or the outbound or fighting for the outbound. There's got to be some cross, I think, of inbound and outbound in, in order to balance it. Yeah, for sure. And the future of travel, once we do have travel, or even just domestically, is definitely going to have to be more sustainable, I think, because you're going to have to choose your travel more carefully. It's going to cost a little bit more. Uh, you're going to have to spend more time in l fewer areas, right? So a lot of the problems we have with tourism won't exist in the future, I, I hope. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Um, you also introduced digital heritage, like a really interesting uh, website. What was it? Uh, let's see. I've got it here. A uh, company that's introducing Tokyo Scan series, uh, different museums. This was in your same four article. Let's see. Raise New Media. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Ra Raise Digital. Actually, so these guys are in Spain. Okay. <laughs> and again, yeah, it's kind of, it's funny, all these uh, these cross kind of uh, border, cross-cultural things that are happening now, but they had actually come here, I think it was last year. And this again is using photogrammetry. So they came in, they they do a lot of stuff walking through back alleys of, of Tokyo. And so they scanned these alleys with phones or, or cameras, um, and then they stitched them together to make basically 3D walkable um, environments. Now this is a little more VR. I mean, of course you can watch it on video, but if you had a headset like an Oculus or, or some of the various VR components, now when you put on a VR headset, you're actually immersed in the space Whereas AR, you're still in your environment, you're in your room, and then the object is here, either floating in space or locked down to a, the floor. And so they are doing a lot more photogrammetry work as well. Um, and again, it's kind of a, a good way to preserve, I think, um, historical areas or places maybe that are going to be knocked down uh, and replaced by a huge skyscraper in the next couple of years here in Tokyo as we see that often. So yeah, they're really doing some cool work and I hope that they're another kind of younger startup that hopefully by me mentioning them that, uh, you know, tourism agencies and cities see the value in this stuff as not just being like a novelty, uh, wow, that's cool, but it can actually have a lot of applications. Yeah, for sure. I see a lot of potential with that kind of technology. Uh, yeah. Another company you mentioned is Yellow Design. Yeah, Yellow Design. So they're in Ireland. These guys were the ones that gave me a call back in March and said, hey, Jess, I think we could do something with one of the uh, the drone uh, pilots that we work with. So they're actually a, a design agency and they do a lot with web. But it was last year that they decided to make a, a product called, um, was it, let me get this right, AR or Smart City AR360. And what they wanted to do was help uh, cities have a way to kind of monitor their tourism capacity and traffic using public transport data. <clears throat> and so they were, this is all um, available to the public basically, where you can see data on where people are going and when using public transport specifically. And so huge problem there in Belfast where they are is everyone goes to the same places at the same time. Uh, it's a really rather small city, and so they wanted to kind of map this and give the city a way to see uh, where they're having their bottlenecks and be able to um, hopefully study it and be able to plan better. But on top of that, they developed an app for, for consumers to be able to download, and A, it can help them navigate using AR technology. If you're walking around, there can be arrows or information. Um, you can also experience there in Belfast the home of the Titanic, where the Titanic was docked. You can basically, if you're there at that location, you'd get a little pop-up. You can buy for like $5 a ticket to experience the Titanic in life size, in real size, and view the Titanic at information. Uh, it's a really cool product. It's not out yet, but I think they're going to be pushing it out sometime this year. And so they were preparing for kind of over-tourism, uh, how to help that problem with the cities and also for visitors when they physically go there. And I think they still have an application for that, you know, maybe in the next 12 to 18 months when people come back. So what I suggested to them now is while people aren't visiting Belfast, you can still put the app out and you could let people experience some of those, thing, those things at their home. And so Yellow Design is you know, really looking ahead at what are the problems both from the city side as well as the consumer side and the small businesses around uh, the tourist areas that probably don't get a lot of recognition. Uh, what the app will do is tell you if you're visiting the harbor around 1130 and viewing the Titanic, 
By the way, there are a few cafes within half a mile away that you can go and visit or a pottery shop or whatever it may be. And so it's really tying in a whole ecosystem. And so I really hope that they uh, get the they get the opportunity to deploy their uh, their app here soon and we can all try it. Yeah, that's really exciting. And it, it reminds me of the point you raised about um, it'll tell you which street to take, which is less busy. We, we have this in our cars with GPS. The <laughs> GPS tells us take this road instead of that one because it's less traffic. Well, that is perfect for traveling to a place that usually only one road or one street is really busy. The next one is less busy. And because people are on their phones, there is that data in real yeah. time. So I, I, you mentioned Google as well. Google is very interested in this kind of technology. And hopefully we will see um, this kind of recommendation as you're visiting a place. Oh, you should take this street because it's less busy, especially now because of coronavirus. Oh, well, yeah. One of the things I talked with Michael at Yellow Design was I think that your application now, it, it incorporates the safety feature because when people do come back, you could actually um, make sure that the thing, uh, the app tells them the distance they need to stay at. If they're getting too close, you know, various elements. And so... Uh, safety, psychological safety, I think, is another big thing people are going to have trouble with coming back. Is it is it really safe for me to be in this area? And so, you know, if there's ways that these apps can somehow tell you, uh, you know, safer places to go or not, that's also a thing that AR. Um, and there's also like sound or voice AR, which is a whole other element coming into play where you could be walking around and when you walk 50 minutes, 50 meters ahead, that in that area, a voice or some kind of sound is activated, like maybe someone's voice telling you to look left, and you could look left and notice something that wasn't there. So that's really cool technology that's uh, a little more a little more in the pipeline, but uh, it's definitely coming. Yeah, and personalization, right? So I'm I'm a vegan. Um, when I'm somewhere and somebody's having a vegan restaurant special, they can alert me to that. Oh, a block over if you're interested. But you know, you have to. Hopefully in the future, you can kind of control how much of this information comes in. You don't want to be bombarded by, yeah. by information all the time as well. Sure. But certainly you can choose how much and how often, right? Yeah, yeah. of course, of course, yes. Uh, you also mentioned Questo. Questo, yeah. Questo is a, a, a cool little app, a uh, startup out of Romania. Uh, so I'm... I'm tying about every every country here that's uh, great I, i've discovered all of them uh mostly during lockdown some of them before you know based here in tokyo uh which is amazing that you can connect with all these people worldwide but um questo was built to provide quests for people to experience on their phone this is not using ar uh basically just like a guided walking tour uh, you can go to a city and uh, you can find a quest that was built uh, either by people or maybe it's a tour agency. They basically register them on Questo. You can decide if you want a haunted quest or if you want an educational quest, whatever it is. A lot of them have themes to them or, or more of a story. And so basically you can purchase, I think in, they're anywhere from 10 to $15. You purchase the quest and then there's various clues as you're walking around the city to find uh, something written on the back of the clock tower or visit this cafe and there's a book on the shelf and once you discover it or take a picture, it unlocks another clue. And so I think that this is also going to be the future of – well, I don't want to say the future even. I want to say the present of – uh, moving forward, how we all interact with tourism, and we could actually disperse large groups by giving people quests, various quests. You could maybe take, let's just say, even if we do have large tour groups that still exist, you could disperse that 30-person group into fives, give them all six quests, all meet back, and they could share what they learned. And so I think this company is on the right track. 
And of course, even now during COVID, you could still go out and do a few quests even without uh, mass tourism. Yeah, and uh, one of the exciting things I think which would appeal to anybody who likes Pokemon Go or any kind of game where you can get points or you can get different value added by right. doing the activity, um, they also give points if you uh, figure out the quest or find certain things in your, it's like an online scavenger hunt. So yeah, lots of great potential there to kind of educate the consumer in a way as well by educating through fun and games, yeah. right? This is this might be definitely the future of guiding. Yep. Yeah, I do. Th I do think so. The gamification of it all. Yeah. How fun! And of yes. course, you mentioned streaming events. Yes. Yes. This is definitely. I think we we've all become accustomed to it now. Um, and there's various kinds of events or webinars or interviews like this that have come about. But I have seen that more and more, you know, I think the music industry really took the lead here on this. Um, but I do see the potential for destinations to also. And I think Australia a couple months ago did a big week long campaign. Uh, I think, you know, it was like 12 hours each day for five days straight. And they were in various locations and it was all live streaming. Um, and so I think that the technology has gotten to the point where, I mean, a live stream here or a pre-recorded, you know, you can, you can safeguard and do pre-recorded live streams as well. This is going to be something that a lot of destinations should consider. I call it a destination broadcast. I mean, you could almost literally create uh, a platform maybe where just as you have TV channels, you could say, I want to tune into the, the Kyoto channel today. And it's not just... You know, there's a lot of those live cams. You can go on uh, YouTube and watch them. They're rather, rather boring. They're interesting, but, you know, five or ten seconds. But you could almost create like a series of broadcasts for destinations for people to tune in at different times, I believe, with live streaming. That's a great idea. And yeah. uh, something that I've always suggested to destinations or products or services is you have to be reliable, right? So if you're doing live streaming, do it every weekday right do it at this time and this time every day do it yeah. on every friday like just choose a time and place and keep it up don't yeah, just right. give it up every now and again like some sometimes we'll make a destination map places are really happy to be on it and then we hear from the users that that place is never open or the <laughs> timing you know even on google map and the place listing now with coronavirus, there's a lot of unpredictability in terms yeah. of, am I going to go and be able to get that? Are they even going to be open, right? Sure. So live streaming, I think, has that layer of transparency. And yep. that helps the customer feel like, oh, wow, they are there right now. I could go virtually or I could go physically and visit or take part in their service or product, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why every destination or tourism board right now doesn't have a 9 a.m. show that if I'm going to go to Kyoto tomorrow, that I could tune in and see like what are the what are the weather conditions, what are you know what's happening, what's new, what's you know, be aware of this. Um, very easy to do, very cost efficient too. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe sometimes such drastic change. Uh, limits people's ability to pivot quickly but it's it's really not that hard and once you do it once it's a little painful do it a second time i could have done that better by the time you get to the third go around you're like all right like it's starting to click and so i would highly recommend uh destinations leverage live streaming right now and like you said be consistent just know that at nine o'clock i can tune in and if i miss it you know it's it's archived somewhere on demand yeah and a lot of um, local destinations or local products or services or people working in business in Japan seem very nervous about live streaming. Um, Jessup and I are both live streaming professionals, so please get in touch. Um, also, a bit of advice, after your live stream and once it's hosted somewhere, you can edit it. Right. Yeah. So if something goes really wrong, which actually is good because people <laughs> trust it more and they think, right. oh, wow, that is really happening right now. You know, sure. Right. So yeah. I, I wouldn't edit it. But if you really want to, you can edit yep. after the fact. So if, if you say something that's not appropriate or something, you can edit that out. It's only the live streaming audience 
that sees everything. Yeah, and it's authentic. Yeah, authentic. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay to make a mistake, especially when you're live. And I think that people actually connect with that more, and they remember. Like, so I think we have to make things a little more authentic as well. I, I think you had mentioned like the greenwashing and just kind of sometimes tourism makes things to be everything perfect. And we all know that when we travel, like it's not always perfect or paradise either. And so some of the the hardships that even you go through when you travel actually do make the the experience uh, more memorable, uh, and and a lot of good can come out of uh, a bad experience too. You know, someone could step up and and show you their true sympathy or empathy, basically. So, yeah, I think it's important that we're all just kind of uh, being a little more real, a little bit more transparent here. And so, you know, live streaming definitely does that. Absolutely. And that's, you know, the honesty part of it. How many TV programs do you watch in Japan where everything they eat is oishi, right? <laughs> Every review is only positive, right? Whereas the Western perspective, we want more reality in our reviews. We sure. want to know what the person actually thought, like what was the good and the bad. Maybe I don't agree with them, but even if they say something a little bit negative, I kind of trust them more. Right. Sure. So there's that element of it, too, which I think needs to happen more in Japan yeah. with tourism. I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to mention before we finish? Well, I think we've covered quite a lot here. You definitely My did your goodness. research. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that was so fun. And uh, I think we definitely, we touched on so many things. I do want to mention your podcast, which I thought was really fun. Can you introduce that a little bit? Yeah, so I, two weeks ago, started a podcast, again, just to kind of keep myself busy, keep myself sharp. Um, it's called Where Did Travel Go? And this was started by a friend of mine named Laurel, Laura Blackhall. Uh, Laura is from the UK. She's lived in Asia for seven, eight years, I think. She started a tour company called Hello Tours in Hong Kong four or five years ago. Um, very successful there. She then expanded to Singapore and then moved to Japan last year to start up her third uh, operation. And they kicked off in January. Great timing. <gasps> Um, no, yeah. Yeah, so they, uh, you know, they're still up operating. She has not closed the doors, actually. So big shout out to uh, Laura. And they've started uh, or will be starting residence tours, basically ways for not only for, uh, visitors to experience their city, but locals to go out and maybe experience their city in ways that they haven't. And so we're talking about that. But the podcast is really meant to be kind of a sounding board for both of us to really be able to, A, share information on what we're both hearing from the travel industry, and B, bring a little bit of humor, lightheartedness to it, also keeping it very real. Um, you know, we make a lot of mistakes on the podcast. And so we're going to try to do uh, every Friday as well, like you said, keep it consistent. Every Friday, try to put out a, a podcast on Anchor and Spotify, I believe, called uh, Where Did Travel Go? That's awesome. And if you're ever looking for guests, Okay. <laughs> definitely, definitely, mark, definitely. Mark, me mark me down. Mark me down. I'd believe, love to I, collaborate. I believe collaboration, it's really become a collaborative economy now. And so, you know, Laura and I probably never would have really worked together previously. We're really in different spaces of travel, but um, now everyone has to kind of come together to move forward collectively. I mean, I think I heard someone say, it was very true, she said, you know, there's nobody on earth that is not affected by the current situation. You know, a lot of times when things happen, oh, it happened in the US or it's happened in the Middle East and that's tragic, but you know, I'm still okay here. Literally everyone is in this together. And so I think that a lot of companies and individuals now have to come together and more of, you know, trying to get yours or the company's trying to get its own profits. It's really now going to be about a collaborative economy, uh, which goes into like what I call new travel too, um, where it's really going to be about, okay, the tour operators really need to work closely with the destination, not separately and just trying to profit off of their own tours. Um, the hotels, the airlines, everyone really needs to say, all right, we're all in it together. It's all one big food chain, to be honest. And if one link is broken, it's all broken. So I hope that uh, 
Laura and I really want to share our experience, but we also want to share the experience of others and give them an opportunity to tell what they're working on and also what what and how they've pivoted during this time, uh, A, to survive, and then B, to come out of this uh, different or better than uh, before when we got into it. So Absolutely. that's really what the podcast mm. is going to be about. Uh, where did travel go? Hopefully when it comes back, uh, we can pivot the name to where is travel going, I hope. <laughs> yeah, great. And that that is something I always say to people as a consultant as well. You have to promote other businesses. You have to promote other products, even if it's not yours, even if you don't financially benefit. It's really beneficial to you as a brand to yeah. support all the competitors. Don't think competitively, especially now. Let's just support oh. each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Laura, Laura has a great story on the podcast about when she got started that there were one of the tour operators in Hong Kong had too many bookings that he couldn't handle. And he actually gave Laura some of her first customers. And that's how she got started. So really, really interesting story from her. And I think she wants to continue to do that. And I know she has great relationships with the other tour operators doing same kind of tours here in Tokyo, but they actually work together. And especially now all bonding together. So yeah, I, I totally, totally believe that it's great to, uh, you know, the more you give, the more it's going to be reciprocal and you'll, you'll receive in the end. So. And one of the great tips I got from your podcast was about Akia Hunter. So finding the empty houses, which has been a very popular theme on this series as well. We've had a few people talking about their house renovations. Yeah, so these guys, we met them last week. It's two guys, one from Canada, the other from the U.S., and they basically have started a new business where what they want to do is I think there's 80 million Akia. Uh, Akia are abandoned homes in Japan, for those that don't know. Uh, they said one of the biggest problems is that the data is so scattered uh, different um, – in the different prefectures, it's ordered in different ways. The real estate companies, there's no standardization. So what they're actually trying to do is first figure out what kind of all the data they can get their hands on and trying to bring some structure to it. And so that anyone that's interested in Akia, it's a bit intimidating, can find things easily. And then beyond that, being able to provide services to take people, be able to see, you know, they said the reality is 80% of most of them aren't you know, probably structurally sound to, to live in or do something. But one of the cool things that they want to do is not only like buy or, or receive a free house, but what do we do when we have the house then? You know, do you live in it permanently? Is it temporary? Is it a guest house? And then what do we build around the community and, and make it a place that's giving back to the community? So if I go down there to Izu and have a house, what kind of impact am I going to make on the community or how can I work together with the community for tourism or just sustainable um, existence? If more people come down and are occupying Akia that weren't there prior, uh, how do we do this sustainably? And so the guys are building kind of this out. It's called uh, Akia and Inaka. Uh, they have a website. Uh, I think they just put it up a week or two ago. So check that out. I'll probably be having them on the podcast as well, and hopefully you can too moving forward. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, getting more international residents, getting anybody out into the rural areas is definitely connected to travel because we know that local residents in Japan, especially international residents, are kind of an amazing bridge of information yeah. outside of Japan and give a lot of free social media marketing for <laughs> rural areas. So we definitely want to get people, if they want to, buy an old yeah. abandoned house to get them yes. out to the country areas and help rebuild those dying communities, definitely. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, last comment from Holly. Holly, you're awesome. You two <laughs> feed off each other very well. This was excellent, very interesting interview. Thank you so much. And hopefully there's people out there who didn't comment but enjoyed our talk today. Um, yes. And thank you so much, Jessup. That was awesome. All right. Well, thanks for having me, Joy. Yeah. And hopefully I'll appear on your podcast sometime. We'll make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Tomorrow again at 9 a.m. Uh, we're talking about sustainable online shop and vegan candle making.
All right. Have a good day, everyone. Take care.